So welcome everybody to uh, the last part of the, the English evening today and uh, my guest is uh, Scott Empler. So Scott, do you want to say a few words about yourself, who you are and what you're doing? Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Scott Embler. I'm uh, one of the co-creators along with Mark Lines, the Discipline Agile Toolkit. I am also the thought leader behind the Agile modeling and the Agile data methods from the early 2000s. Um, and some of you may have seen me speak at uh, earlier OOP conferences in the past. Yeah, and you're also the, the author of Refactoring Databases, the book that I lent to someone and he never returned it. Uh, so, and it's obviously a, use, a, a very useful book. So what we are going to talk about today is uh, data technical debt. And uh, you, are, you have a, a talk about uh, data technical debt as well as technical debt at uh, the conference. So let's start with some definitions. So what is technical debt? So, so technical debt is uh, a measure of quality or lack of quality. And, you know, uh, the common metaphor is just like you have financial debt, you have credit card debt or bank debt or mortgage, um, you have technical debt. So you have this um, poor quality throughout your, throughout your organization, throughout your assets. Uh, and it has has an effect on your ability to uh, to respond um, and to uh, evolve your systems, evolve your your assets. And the other term is data technical debt, which I assume you coined. So, what is data technical debt? Yeah, I'm not completely sure if I'm the one that coined it. I, I might have, uh, you know, it's something that a bunch of us have been bouncing around for a few years now. And it's basically uh, recognizing that there are data quality problems and that some aspects of uh, technical debt are actually focused on, on the data, not just the code, not just the systems. And I think um, it's something that's been overlooked and is actually a very serious problem in most organizations. And we, uh, tend not to not to deal with it um, in many cases because the of the what, what I tend to call the cultural in uh, the cultural divide between you know the developers the systems people and the data people and they don't talk well uh, with each other still after all these years and uh, so where technical debt is a reasonably common thing in the developer world it's not that talked about in the data world and that's a problem because we have very serious data quality problems out there. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I'm wondering is um, what are the consequences of data technical debt? What are some experiences? Obviously it is something that is important to you. So have you seen any consequences that are very severe or what, what made you think about it and why do you focus on, on this subject? Yeah, so if, if you if you look at some of the, so first of all, I'll talk about some stats. So um, Gartner, uh, a couple of years ago now, uh, basically came out and said that the average or the average organization uh, loses fifteen million dollars a year on uh, due to data quality problems. Now this is like mid 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 sized to large organizations, I would imagine. But uh, the and then uh, HBR working with I believe IBM. Uh, a few years ago, uh, revealed that the U.S. economy loses three trillion dollars a year because of uh, poor quality data. So it's a reasonably important thing to be looking at. Um, so, but the you know, but to, to actually take a look at what's happening in your organizations, the it it results in poor quality information, uh, which then results in poor quality uh, decisions. And I think that's you know that's where the real issue is. Like you know, people don't have the access to the data that they need. They the data is old. It's um, it's inconsistent with each other. You don't have you can't don't actually have the information that you need. Like it's probably out there. You just can't get it, um, or you know, you can't. Uh, it should be there, but it's not because the data and the back end is messed up. So there's a bunch of reasons why you can't get the information that you need right now. Um, and that's that's impacting your ability to make good decisions. So what you're basically saying is that there is poor quality of data. So I, I imagine, for example, that um, so I, I recently moved to, to a different city. So maybe there is still the address somewhere uh, around and it, they, they still locate me in Berlin, even though so I'm living in, in Kaiserslautern nowadays. So um, if I think about that kind of problem, um, 
that's quite a different problem from code quality. With code quality, me as a software architect or as a software engineer, uh, it is obviously something that I care about and that I can influence. However, data quality, like the address is outdated, that is something that seems to be related to the business domain. So why, how can I improve that situation and why is it something that I should care about? Well, what happens, in, so, so say, for, well, I, you would probably care that your mail isn't getting to you or taking a long time to get to you. But uh, what happens if it was your salary data? And, you know, you're, you know, the, for some, from, from some reason, your raise yeah. didn't go through and you're not being paid or you're in the wrong tax bracket and you're being taxed more than you should have, or you weren't being taxed sufficiently. And then now suddenly the government comes to you and says, oh, by the way, you owe us, uh, you know, you owe us another 30,000 euro because uh, we hadn't bothered to collect it, you know, for the last year or two. So, so you should care. Um, you know, uh, what, would, what would happen to you if your senior executives were making decisions based on cash flow and the cash flow data was wrong? And your organization, and, and there's and organizations have gone broke because of this thing. By the way, this is not a made-up mm -hmm. example. Um, and what was happening was there a few years ago. Now there was an organization where the CFO was maintaining everything in a spreadsheet. And this is a reasonably large organization, so this is um, might not have been the brightest idea. But they were tracking cash flow in a, in a spreadsheet, and they thought they had more money than they did. So their loans got called and suddenly they were out of business. And then when all of the, all this was audited to figure out, well, why did these guys get wiped out? Um, it got tracked back to a spreadsheet and to a, a, you know, a, a miscalculation in a spreadsheet. And the executives were fundamentally, well, just basically making um, poor decisions, thinking they had money when they didn't. Um, so that's a fairly serious problem that you might want to care about. Yeah, um, and, and I couldn't agree more. However, if we stick to that example, I mean, that spreadsheet is probably done by probably even that executive. And uh, me as a software engineer or as a software architect, I've actually never seen it. So how can I influence it? How can I put it on my agenda and, and improve things? Yeah, well, you would have to be able to measure things, right? So. Um, like certainly the, the systems that you do have access to are probably working with data. So how much of your code, yeah, so here's something that a developer should care about. How much of your code do you write that has to, has to, tra has to translate data because it's coming in in the wrong format or it's inconsistent between two data sources and you've got to write code that cleans it up or you've got logic in the UI that uh, is capturing data or displaying in a different format so that way people can do whatever they do with it and then you got to you got to translate it back into whatever the data source wants um i would care about that and and because because the, the fact is that technical data in your code is the result of poor data quality to begin with i would recommend fixing the real problem because the problem is not the technical debt in the code the the problem is the the technical debt in the database and you, you have now, so not only do you have that technical debt, now you've got all this code technical debt and you got to maintain it and all that good sort of stuff. Um, and is it correct? <laughs> Who knows, right? Um, is your database being, is your data being tested? Uh, or worse yet, you've got this, and, and you, you know, you'll have this shared data source where, you know, your, your system accesses it and does something with, with the data. My system accesses it and does something with the data. Are we working under the same business rules? Or am I doing things to the data that then have a, an effect on your system and vice versa? And now we've both got code on each of our ends cleaning up the mess that the other guy created. Um, and then multiply that by hundreds or thousands, depending on how many systems access that data source. So it, it really it adds up. So it becomes an issue of coupling. So data sources are a, a source in most organizations are a source of very high coupling uh, because you got all these systems mm -hmm. accessing mm -hmm. the same data source, right? So because they're a source of high coupling, anything coupled to it has got an issue if there's a quality problem in the, in the data source. Mm -hmm. So two questions. First of all, so would you recommend to go to the business people and talk to them about data quality and how it should be improved because uh, maybe they are the sort of source of the of the data technical debt. Is that something that you would advise? 
Um, sometimes, yeah. Um, well, well, certainly, you know, you should, you know, regardless of what type of technical debt you're talking about, you should be helping to educate the business uh, because they're making decisions around that, around whether or not the technical debt gets injected to begin with. Um, and they're certainly making decisions around whether or not you're going to invest in fixing and addressing those quality problems. So, um, yeah, the more the, the the better the business understands, probably the better shape you're in. But uh, certainly, uh, there's issues around. Uh, you know, certainly, you know, they might be creating uh, bad, uh, bad data technical debt, uh, without a doubt. But there's also, you know, but some of the decisions they make. You know, you know the classic, you know, got to be on time and on budget, so it's easier just create another data source rather than use our existing ones, right? So now you've got uh, you've got storage issues, you've got consistency issues, and. And all that good sort of stuff, right? And then all the all the usual, you know, you got to got to maintain and support multiple things. So the so yeah, I would help the business understand that. But it really is on the on the developers and on the on whoever's responsible for data stuff in your organization to be working together more effectively to ensure that either you're you're, you're injecting less te data technical debt, um, but also that you're you're paying some of it down appropriately. And the other thing you just mentioned that uh, if you have a shared database that of, that leads to to very tight coupling. So, what do you advise to stay away from shared data sources and shared uh, databases? There is this. I'm not sure whether you you're aware of that, but there there is this uh, famous tweet that uh, where, where there is a Star Wars Death Star and a few Tie Fighters, and it says those are small microservices, and that is the large database, this sort of Death Star. So is that something that you sort of can relate to? Where that you th uh, do you think we should get rid of those centralized databases, and uh, that they are sort of the core of the problem? No, it's not. No, that's 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 wacky. Um, that 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 might be a problem in some organizations, but you know, it, it's not the technology. This is where the um, this is part of the cultural um, impedance mismatch. Um, the developers don't get it. Um, you know, if it's a microserv, you know, if it's a microservice with its own database and behind the scenes rather than one big database, um, who cares, right? You can still have you know significant problems with that. Um, the, the problem that the microservices guys are completely blind to is what do you do on reporting? What do you, uh, you know, the, how do you get all this data out of the microservices and then report against it into a data warehouse and BI and all that good sort of stuff? So the fact that you split them into microservices, maybe you've architected things slightly better or maybe you've just blown it again. Um, because the fact that it's a large centralized database tells me exactly nothing. Um, it, it depends on the design of that database. Like I've seen some phenomenally well-designed um, centralized databases that the microservices guys would have no hope of ever being as effective as. I've also seen some big databases that are complete dog's breakfast. So, it, you know, it really does depend. So, it, you know, that's not the issue. Now, certainly there's the concept of data architecture yet, without a doubt. Uh, but, um, and frankly, that a lot of data architectures are not the greatest. But um, but then again, a lot of systems architects are not the greatest either. So, um, you know, it really, yeah. So just tell me it's microservices, tell me it's a centralized database, tells me it, it pretty much nothing. Um, you know, I'd, I'd have to go look to see what actually happened rather than, you know, whatever, whatever you know, whatever you know, architectural strategy you're using this year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, what would your advice be on uh, avoiding technical debt? Is there like some easy to follow things that I should um, do to avoid data technical debt? Or is there something that a lot of people are doing wrong and that they, that they could easily uh, improve on? Yeah, um, there's, no e there's no easy answer to that because you know, the answer is it depends. So that's, I guess that's an easy answer. But um, you know, it, it boils down to, to well, you, I, I know you're familiar with uh, Martin Fowler's technical debt quadrant, right? And so it, in some ways it gets down to that. And in, and in my presentation later on this week, I'm going to be walking through the quadrant and walking through the implications of you know, what the heck are you doing to make these mistakes in, in each of these quadrants. But um, at the end of the day, it really, it really gets down to, do you have the skills to do the job? Are you thinking the architecture through? Are you thinking the design through? You know, do you understand normalization? Um, it, there's some basic, basic, basic fundamental concepts in the data world that, that developers tend to blow. 
Um, and and they're not tend not to be working well with the data folks. You know, and, and those are generalizations. But um, you know, the you, you'll see developers injecting data technical data a lot, or and just normal technical data to begin with. But uh, because they don't have the skills to avoid it, to be you know to avoid it. So yeah, understanding data architecture, uh, you know, um, strategies, understanding data database design strategies, understanding uh, you know how to manipulate and work with data. All just you know having the fundamental skills to the job is the, the critical thing. Um, but yeah, trying you know trying to avoid coupling, you know, minimize coupling, which is what uh, uh, you know have high cohesion, low coupling. Um, you know, that's, that's basically what data normalization is all about uh, when it gets down to it. So, you know, knowing, ba having basic fundamental concepts like that is critical. Mm -hmm. So there is a question from, uh, in, in the chat by, by uh, Rudolf R. And um, I guess that that goes back to the question of around the centralized database. And what he said, asks is, what about a single source of truth for the origin of data? And uh, so we're still for exchange, and I guess probably also rest nowadays. So I guess the the question is: so if we don't use a shared database, and instead we have an interface uh, implemented with so Whistle or or rest or whatever, uh, would that help? Is that any better than having that shared data centralized database? What's your opinion about that? Um, yeah, so you're, you're basically talking about having uh, encapsulating access to the data. Right. Um, yeah, classic developer. So, um, which is great. I'm a firm believer in that. You know, um, I actually wrote, did some of the original work in uh, object relational mapping and database encapsulation. Um, so those are all those are all good things because uh, you're more than likely reducing coupling when you're doing that. Um, depends, but more than likely you're reducing coupling and reducing coupling is generally a good thing. So, so that's okay. But it's like, but it still gets back to, you know, the fact that it's a centralized database tells me exactly nothing. It, it, it just doesn't um, because there's very good reasons to have a centralized database. There's very good reasons to not have a centralized database. I don't know your environment, so I can't tell you whether or not that's a good strategy until I know the context. So, but yeah, so encapsulating access generally better, but you've also got to remember, it's not just about what you as a developer or as an architect or whatever it is you're trying to do is focused on right now. Um, data is long lasting. Uh, it's persistent, you know, by definition. Mm -hmm. The, it's a shared resource. It sh should be a shared asset. Um, so you need to think long term. You need to look beyond whatever application or whatever is it you're building right now, and understand the overall implications uh, at the enterprise level. That's what's going to help uh, make or break you. So uh, yeah, and, yeah. So and, and, and bottom line, even though I'm a firm believer in, in encapsulation layers. At the end of the day, you're never going to have one shared encapsulation layer unless you're a small org, right? You know, the Java guys will be doing their thing, the .NET guys will be doing their thing, the COBOL guys will be doing their thing, and so on, right? And you'll never have one shared strategy. And as a result, you've got more coupling and you got to maintain it all. So, yeah, you know, uh, it, encapsulation, encapsulating access is probably better than not encapsulating access. But it's it's not. But that's only solving one one aspect of the overall um, data quality issue. Mm -hmm. Like if you're encapsulating bad data, I don't care what your strategy is. <laughs> it's still bad data. Um, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's we got to look at the big picture on this one. Mm -hmm. So one of is so um, one thing that that you're saying is uh, it's probably unlikely that you will ever be able to encapsulate uh, data access. So so that's a good point. But you, uh, what you also seem to say is okay. If I have that, if I do have such an encapsulation, then there would be more decoupling. So, um, can you explain that in more detail? Because if I do a select statement on a shared database and I do the very same thing, it's just that I do it with REST or SOAP, uh, you know, I get all the customer data and there is a SOAP service that gives me all the customer data. I don't see how that would increase uh, encapsulation because it's just a different way of doing the same thing. Yes, but you're assuming that everybody has a clue. 
So, <laughs> and they don't. So here's the here. So the idea, if you force everybody through your encapsulation layer, you can then uh, and there's multiple strat, you know, multiple strategies to, to implement that. Um, you then are in a position where you can start enforcing access control easily uh, in a consistent manner. You can access, you can enforce business rules. You can enforce uh, calculations, consistent calculations, and that's a big thing. Um, you also, uh, what also happens is, you know, you've got the encapsulation layers accessing the data somehow, it might not just be SQL, but it's something, right? So they get, you know, they, so you got the encapsulation layer, it's accessing the data, and then all the, all the programs are hitting the, hitting the encapsulation layer. Now you're in a position where the development tools are generally better than the data tools. So if I am trying to figure out, uh, you know, do, do, you know, tracing, you know, where my bugs are and, and figuring, you know, figuring, you know, refactoring and good stuff like that, um, because I now have my application code coupled to my encapsulation strategy, I've probably got better tooling and better testing and all this sort of stuff uh, for my code than I do for the database. So, um, I've improved my ability to actually, actually write cleaner code if I've got the skills um, to write the to write cleaner code, to test better, to uh, refactor more easily. So there's there's definitely that. And um, if I built the encapsulation layer right, then I, I can enforce critical business rules and calculations at that layer. Um, but here's where it all falls apart. Uh, <laughs> how do you do reporting? Uh, you know, how do you get at, you know, you know the, the data warehousing and business intelligence stuff is a lot different than the application stuff. So I'm still, I'm still going to be coupling my DWBI stuff to that data source somehow as well, and I've still got the business rule issue and that. But but I've more than likely decoupled. I've more than likely made it easier uh, by doing that with that with those sorts of strategies than if I had like 100 apps hitting you know with the hard coded SQL hitting the database. Um, so mm -hmm. you know, but architectural trade offs. Right. Mm -hmm. You're always going to have coupling, you know, no matter what you do. And coupling is, you know, the root of all evil. So, yeah, so that's that's probably like the, the golden rule of, of software architecture, I guess. Um, so the, the other thing I'm wondering is if there is so much data technic adapt, uh, how do you remove it? I mean, obviously, uh, as you said, databases are persistent and there is all the data in the database that's obvious so refactoring them is hard so once you have poor data quality or maybe even a, a bad database schema what's your way out of that what's your advice on it yeah so uh it's nasty you need to gain database refactoring skills and uh, database testing skills. So one of the challenges uh, that we see because of the, the divide between the developers and the data folks is that there's very different strategies and way of looking at quality issues and uh, addressing quality issues. So generally the data community is trying to get everything right up front um, and then they don't the um, just nature of the beast. So, um, or they might get it up right up front, but things change on them or somebody else comes in and fiddles with things, you know, usual, you know, usual reality uh, type issues. So unfortunately <laughs> um, they've been slow to adopt basic, uh, you know, things that developers consider fairly basic like automated regression testing and refactoring tools and, and good stuff like that. So. Yeah, and, and, and that those are generalizations, right? There's some organizations that are pretty sophisticated when it comes to database development, but for the most part, um, you know, it's, it's like it was 15 years ago. So like for developers, 15 years ago. So it's early days in uh, still in most cases for uh, basic refactoring. And you know, so the uh, question to ask yourself is, you know, if I went into your organization tomorrow and said, you know, you know, show me your customer database. Oh, okay, great, Oracle, blah, whatever. Um, Where's your database regression uh, test suite? Automated regress, regression test suite for it. Um, in many organizations, they wouldn't even know what I'm talking about. Whereas if I asked you, where's your regression test suite for you know that application over there? Oh, here it is. And you know, it might not be the greatest, but you'd still have one. And you'd know what I'm talking about. And you know, you'd you know, you then you'd then you probably a good idea what you still want to do uh, to get it you know better. But um, on the database testing side, um, very few organizations um, have their act together yet. Um, so yeah, so because they 
are struggling with with basic things like automated regression mm. testing, um, it became becomes hard to refactor, right? You know, as you know, you, it's you know you can't safely refactor code unless you can test it and make sure you didn't break things, um, and or at least have tools that can sort of detect if you broke things or probably broke things. So, would you uh, is it wise to invest in such tests and uh, build up um, a test suite? Is that what you would do as as a first step, or would you advise uh, for for something different? I mean, obviously, yeah, it's a I'd, rule of thumb, but you know. Yeah, I'd start. Well, yeah, I'd start digging my way out of the hole, right? So, if data is a is a corporate asset, right? So let, let's let's go after some of the rhetoric now, right? Everybody said, you know, I I. I don't really run into any firm that will tell me, oh, no, data is not an asset. We don't care about data, right? Like, no, it, you know, um, I always hear, well, data is their lifeblood. And it, it, of course, is a corporate asset. And then, and, and as soon as somebody spews that nonsense, um, and like most of the time it's nonsense, the first thing out of my mouth is really, what about your regression test suite? Um, oh, you don't have one? Well, then it's not an asset then, is it? Um, you know, if you've got no plan to, you know, improve it and validate it and all this stuff, then you you really, it's not really an asset. So listen to your rhetoric, start, to, if, if data, if you want your data to be a corporate asset, and I suspect you do, then treat it like a corporate asset, step up and do your jobs. And so start doing, start putting the tests in place that you need to validate, just like, I hope your code is considered an asset, at least some of your code is considered an asset. Um, I would also want my data to be an asset and I would invest in automated tests for that. And I would want to be able to clean it up. So just like, you know, when I see poorly written code that is critical to my organization, I'm gonna fix that problem because that's important. Um, if I see poor quality data um, that's important to my organization, I'm gonna clean it up. Right. And and it has a very interesting side effect. If you start like, you know, like I said earlier, because of the high coupling of systems to the data, even within encapsulation layer, there's still implied coupling. You know, you go to the encapsulation layer, then you go down to the data, right? If I've got data quality problems, um, then I've got I'm potentially coupled to those data quality problems. And I'm probably cleaning things up um, in multiple places now. Uh, as a result, um, and, and even if it's only one app, even even my encapsulation layer is doing a dandy job of cleaning things up. I've still got any reporting going on and and stuff like that, and there's cleanup, you know, ETL ETL jobs that get cleanup going on. So this is an expensive problem, and that is perv you know, pervades multiple systems in your organization. So I would I would highly suggest getting it at the source. Um, mm -hmm. So what I find interesting is um, what, what you just said is that uh, a lot of organizations uh, seem unaware that they should have tests for their, the, for their data. Um, so if I talk to some software engineer who is doing coding, uh, they are usually aware of the fact that they should actually test their code. That seems to be different for, for the data community, as you said. And that leads me to the question, and that leads me to the question, so if I talk about code technical depth, usually I can talk to an engineer and they say, okay, we know that here are some challenges and we know that there is technical depth and it's bad or not too bad. Do you feel that uh, people are more unaware of the data technical depth that they might have compared to the technical depth that they have in, in the code? So is it something that is hidden and that is not that they don't know about because they they don't think in these terms i think the data people have a pretty good clue that they've got data problems um what they don't have an idea about is how they can actually fix them coherently um they often do, then they don't really know how to avoid it um you know they've got you know a lot of them still believe in the big upfront modeling and all this sort of stuff and you know let's lock down access to the database not let the developers use it and um and that's just not realistic and, and you know what, if they try doing that, what do the developers do? They go around them, they create a new data source, and then they do whatever they got to do. So we need to be realistic. And the so the, the traditional data quality strategies um, are what got us into this mess, right? And I work, I go into organizations and they'll, they'll be finger pointing, right? It's, you know, the data guys go, you know, they'll be saying, well, we're responsible for data quality. We should have control, blah, blah, blah. And it's the developers who are at fault. Well, okay, so then you you just told me you 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 have control, but then clearly you don't if it's the developers that are messing everything up, right? And that, so then that's a that's a that's sort of a aha uh -huh type of a uh, of a conversation. 
Um, but yeah, when they're not talking about testing in a coherent manner, then they really don't get quality. It, it's, it's just, you know, different than night and day, right? So, um, so they're not doing, because the thing is, is that, you know, in the old days um, with, the, with waterfall development, they would do all the modeling up front. They would figure out the database design and they would throw it over the wall to the developers who would then use it and, and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and eventually it would get to be tested. So the data guys just walk, wipe their hands of that and not really worrying about testing. Um, and then, then they would complain about, uh, about quality problems. Um, or, or what they would do is their idea of fixing data quality was to, to catch the poor quality data in their ETL jobs. That's what the the, the T mm -hmm. in ETL is is transform. So they would, you know, they'd have this poor quality data source. They would do transformations to hopefully clean it up for the for the data warehouse, uh, and, and then they would um, report on it, and you know things would happen from there. So, but then they've got, and then when you're dealing with multiple data sources, you've got like all the timing problems mm -hmm. and RI problems and all this sort of stuff. So because it's not, you know, a lot of it's not real time or. Yeah, it's quasi real time. Mm -hmm. um, so we are almost at the at the end of uh, of our conversation. Um, I will put a link to agiledata.org in in the show notes. So if people want to uh, know more about uh, about data technical debt and uh, the challenges with that, uh, with there will be a few links. Is there anything else you would like to add? Anything that I didn't uh, ask you that you feel I should have asked you? Um, no, I, I think this is good. Um, I, you know, I just everybody, just I ask you to have patience and to be aware of this issue and and realize mm -hmm. that we do need to work together. You know, the development community, the data community needs to find better ways of working together, which is what the Agile data stuff was all about. Um, the, the techniques are out there. Um, I did not talk about any theory here today whatsoever. I did not uh, talk about anything that I haven't done myself, haven't seen myself in multiple organizations. Um, it is possible. There's no magic here. Um, a lot of hard work, <laughs> but there's no magic. Um, so it, it's possible. And you know, earlier we were talking about the refactoring databases book. Um, now it's old. It's like about 15 years old. But you know, if you've got the ability to type in code from a a, a book, like you know, assuming you don't, have, you've got no budget for tools and can't use the internet to download tools. You know, even, even in that environment, um, you as long as you can type in code from a book, you can do database refactoring too. It's, it really is that straightforward, um, you know, so, and I would recommend tools, but, uh, you know, uh, you can type it in by hand if you like doing that sort of thing. Yeah, so there is light at the end of the tunnel, so thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot for, for uh, discussing it with, uh, with us this evening. Um, there will be another episode uh, tomorrow at lunch, then in German, I'm afraid. Um, and um, I'll put in the show notes, so... Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for being here and enjoy the conference. And I'm looking forward to your to your talks, of course. Thank you. Thank you.